Greetings and welcome to this installment on this video series on strength of materials and mechanics of materials. In this video we will be discussing uh, not gear design, that's well outside the scope of this course, but the combined effects of torsional stress on a gear with bending stress on the same gear. So I'll switch over to my design. Very simple, of course. It's a simplified version of a gear shaft. And what we have here is a gear that has, of course, torsion on it. And it's a drive shaft of some sort. So the drive goes from the, the gear to uh, one end, or it could be both ends. In this case, I'm going to have it simplified and make it just one end. So you'll see that the torque goes something like this and is opposed by a torque going like this at this end. Right. And then this end over here is just assumed to be on a bearing, not actually taking the torque. So the torque travels from this end down to this end. But in order to make sure that the teeth stay engaged, they are jammed into the other teeth. So we have also a bending load. And that might look like this. So I've got force P down here, and that has to be opposed here and here. And these are, I usually refer to them as AY and ZY. So that being said, we are going to have from torsion stress on the shaft here. So here's the shaft. We're going to have stress especially on the outside of the shaft. So the stress on the shaft is going to be um, highest all around the circumference or the cylindrical area of the shaft. And it's going to be practically zero in the middle here. However, because we also have bending, the top is going to be in compression and the bottom is going to be in tension all the way along here. So there's going to be a, a significant stress here and significant stress here. And this is going to be normal stress. Now the stress from the torsion with shear stress, this is going to be normal stress. So this area up here and way down here are going to have high compressive and tensile stresses on them that are normal. But we also found out that the entire cylindrical circumference is going to be in shear stress from the torsion. So right at these two spots, right here and right here, we are going to have combined maximum stresses. In fact, those stresses are going to be here and here because that's where our maximum bending stress is going to be. The torsional stress is the same all along this section of the shaft. But right here and here is where we'll have the highest bending stresses, and so we will have also the highest combined stresses in those two locations. Now that's just one part of it. The bending stress also causes shear stress, but that occurs along the neutral axis or the centroidal axis. So here we are going to have shear stress from the bending. That's in addition to the shear stress from the torsion. And that bending shear stress is going to be fairly consistent throughout this section it's going to be right along this line. So right here, we will have shear stress from bending plus 
the shear stress from torsion. We will have to add them together and we will get a much higher shear stress. So we need to consider both these areas and this area. And what's even more interesting uh, is that when this is rotating, these locations are constantly shifting. So these high combined stresses are constantly being applied and removed and shifted on this particular area. And so it's in significant fatigue. Okay, let's go to our problem solving sheet and calculate this out. So our strategy is to actually do two problems and then combine them. The first problem will be bending. And then our second problem will be torsion. And then we will have to combine them and we will use more circle to show that. So that's our strategy. What are we given? I'll always write these down. Okay, we are given that first off we've got what's in the diagram. Okay. Next we have a load right here, P is four ounces. Yes, it's kind of small. This is a small plastic gear shaft. P equals four ounces. We also have an applied torque here. T equals one tenth of an inch pound. And it is counteracted at this point. I'm going to label these locations A B and Z. So this will be T at B, this will be T at Z, and just remember T at A is zero. Now this load is going to have a reaction here, AY, and a reaction here, ZY. So T will be 0.1 inch pounds and our material is some form of plastic. Some form of engineered plastic uh, for this purpose. We're just not sure which. Just You don't pick a random one. You might want to pick one that's designed for gears and so on. Uh, but you don't want to uh, take the cheapest thing. You want something that's going to work well, but also be uh, economic. All right. We're going to assume a few things. That the gear... drives the torque. Um, A is bearing only. That there's no stress concentration. This is not necessarily a good assumption, but uh, you would expect that there'd be some form of stress concentration here because of the gear. There should be around here. I just simplified all this so we could get an example of combined loading. Uh, stress concentration will cause some problems, but less so in a reasonably ductile material, which um, most polymers are. And that we have a design factor N of 10 based on ultimate strength. And what are we trying to find? 
Okay, so we've got all of our givens. What are we trying to find? We're trying to find the principal stresses and the maximum shear stress for both locations. And identify those locations right here. Actually, right here and right here. Another assumption I'm making is that the shaft is, is really all the way through and that this area right here is in some form of this combined stresses uh, and that the gears kind of aren't there. All they're doing is applying this torque. That will give us a simple to solve yet reasonably conservative set of assumptions. We're finding the principal stresses and time act at those upper and lower locations and at this location. So at both max stress locations. Also, we need to specify an appropriate material. Okay, to do that, we are going to use some of our favorite formulas. For bending, we're going to use the shear force diagram to create the bending moment diagram. Those are going to help us find the bending stress because the bending stress is MC over I. Also find the shear stress. Again, the subscript here is the shear stress from bending. And for a solid circular shaft, the shear stress is easy to calculate. It's 4 thirds V over A, which is a whole lot better than the general shear formula. All right, also to find the shear stress from torsion, we'll use TC over J. Well, that leaves a few things that we don't know. We can find M and V from the shear force and bending moment diagram. Torque is actually given to us right here, but we need C, I, A, and J. So C for a circle is very easy. It's half the diameter or simply the radius. Area, we're going to use diameter as always. Pi over 4 d squared, or pi d squared over 4, and i and j are related. j is simply twice i. i is pi over 64 times d to the fourth, and j is twice that, so it's pi over 32 d to the fourth. Okay, so I think we've got all our formulas here, and the rest of this part of the problem is simply plugging and chugging all of those things. So, now that we've got our strategy, bending, torsion, and then combine, we've got our givens, we know what we're assuming, and we know what we need to find, we're going to use these formulas to calculate it. So we need to do our shear force bending moment diagram first. I have some other videos that are a little more in depth on how to do this, but here I'm going to kind of do it quickly. First we draw lines that represent the various important bits. The black vertical lines are the ends. The horizontal lines represent the zeros of your shear force and the bending moment diagrams. The green one here is where the force is applied, starts or stops for that matter. And we have to label them. Normally I write out shearing force, but I'm constrained by some space here. So shearing force and the units are in ounces. 
and we refer to it as V. And here's the bending moment in inch ounces, and that's referred to as M, and that's zero. Okay, well, to find the reactions here at AY and ZY, I would have to also use some of the moments about A have to equal zero. And this is fairly simple. ZY equals one ounce. And if I sum, sum the moments about Z equals zero, AY ends up being three ounces. Again, if you don't know where these came from, then you should probably go back and review some of the things we covered previously on beams. But this is fairly simple. So now that we've got those reactions, we can fill in our shear force diagram. First thing we see is AY going up three ounces to this level, and then no loads, so it's straight across. Then we got four ounces going down here, and then it's going to be at negative one. No loads going across here, and then at this point here, ZY goes up one ounce and ends up back at zero, which is where we wanted it to be. Then we take the areas of these, three ounces times 0.5, a1 equals 1.5 ounce inches, and this is area 2, equals negative 1.5 ounce inches. And so now we have what we need for our bending moment. This goes up 1.5 and then it linearly goes down, back down to zero. It goes up 1.5, then down 1.5. So we have our V max equals three ounces, and our M max equals 1.5 inch ounces. All right, to make things a little bit simpler. I hope this makes things simpler. I'm just going to calculate these basic ones that are just based on the diameter first. Okay, so C is easy. It's half the diameter, or the radius, again. So that's an eighth of an inch divided by two. makes it a sixteenth of an inch, or 0 0.065 inches. Next we've got the area, pi d squared over 4, so square the eighth, and you end up with Oh, one, two, three square inches. Okay, area moment of inertia is pi over 64 d to the fourth And that gives you 0 0.00001200 inches to the fourth. And J is actually just double that. Again, this is for just a circular cross section. So don't try just doubling I to get J if you've got some other kind of cross-section. You'll have to check your formulas. 
Okay, so we've got these basic calculations down. Now we're in much better shape to finish off all of these things up here. So let's do our flexural stress or our normal stress from bending. That's MC over I. We're going to use our maximum bending stress because that's where we're mostly concerned about it. So that's 1.5 inch ounces. Times C, which is 16th of an inch all over inches to the fourth and then since all of our material properties are in pounds we're going to have to convert this from ounces to pounds so we multiply it by one pound for 16 ounces then we can do a bunch of cancellation ounces here ounces here we've got two inches up here inch times inch and then inches to the fourth down here so we cancel out that to make that squared so we'll end up with pounds per square inch which is what we wanted and that 488 psi okay on to torsional shear stress and that's tc over j Now our torque is 0.1 inch pounds. Well, since we're already in pounds, we don't have to do that ounces thing. C is 16th of an inch. J here and let's check our units again inches times inches on top so that's inches squared on top they cancel out with inches to the fourth on the bottom twice so I end up with again pounds over square inches which is a stress what we we're hoping for 260 PSI Okay, finally we're ready to complete more circle. And we're going to have to do it twice. First one we're going to do is for the tops and bottom areas here. This is an area of high stress because of the normal bending stress. It's going to be compressive on the top and tensile on the bottom of 488 psi. The torsional stress here is applied all the way around the circumference, all the way down the shaft. So those two areas have both the maximum bending stress and the maximum torsional stress. We'll do th that calculation for these two locations first then we'll go back and do the other calculation okay so to set that up we need to calculate where the center is first so the center of the circle is the average of the normal stress in one direction and the normal stress in the perpendicular direction but we only have one normal stress so we'll call that stress x going to be stress B is 488 psi. Stress in the y direction is zero. And our tau shear stress xy is going to be 260 psi. So our center again is the average of 488 and zero. So we'll write that formula in there.
and so our center is 244 psi. That makes it fairly simple. So our radius, on the other hand, is a little more complicated. It is the square root of half the difference of stress x and stress y squared plus tau xy squared. So of course, since this is 0, half of stress x is going to be that same 244 psi. squared plus tau xy squared and we get 358 psi which also ends up being our maximum shear stress. Okay. With just these numbers, we can construct our Mohr's circle. So we're going to use the center, 244 psi, and the radius of 358 psi. Going to find these spots first. Here's C of 244. The radius is 358. So that means our principal stress here this is our first principal stress is 602 because principal stress equals C plus R equals 244. PSI plus 358 PSI equals 602 PSI. Our second principal stress is C minus R. And that's negative 114 PSI. And right about here is our maximum shear stress. And probably do a better job if I had a uh, protractor or a compass, but this should work out. Now it's also helpful to note the location of the initial stress situation. So that is 488 to 60. So it's about here, here, 488 to 60. And there's the triangle it creates. This is our radius. And here is our angle phi. Now phi is the angle here between this radius and our principal stress. So this is our stress in physical space in the x direction. This is the angle between them in Mohr's circle, but Mohr's circle is twice physical space. So phi equals 2 theta, and it's equal to the inverse tangent of y over x. 
vertical here is 260. But watch out for the horizontal. A lot of people just put in 488. That's not it. The horizontal is this distance here, which is 488 minus the 244. So it's another 244. And our phi comes out to 46.8 degrees. That means our angle theta is 23.4 degrees. So from the x direction to our maximum normal stress or our first principal stress is at an angle of 23.4 degrees at that location. Okay, next we're going to do the exact same thing but for just the shear stresses from both tension and from bending. So I'll write down shear stress from bending and on a beam you could use the general shear formula VQ over IT but because it's a circular cross section we can use four thirds V over A. So here's four thirds and we found our shearing force here of three ounces all over the area and that's 0.0123 inches squared but we have ounces up here so we have to multiply by one pound per 16 ounces and that gives us 20.3 PSI. Okay, much lower than the other ones. All right, so we are going to construct more circle again. We're going to write down all of our stresses. So the first thing is, make sure you write this down. Our normal stresses in either X or Y are zero. Then our shear stress in XY is the addition of these two. So 20.3 and 260. So And we can just dispense with the point three and make it 280 PSI. Our center, pretty easy to calculate that. Stress X plus stress Y over two, zero. And our radius, I'm going to write out the formula here anyway because it's just a good idea and it helps you memorize it. And it's the square root of stress X minus stress Y over 2 quantity squared plus tau XY squared. And considering this is all zero, all we're doing is taking the square root of a squared value and we just get that same value, 280 PSI. So we have to draw a circle with center at 0, 0 and a radius of 280 PSI. That's pretty easy. Two eighty minus two eighty So I'll label these as our principal stresses, and this is our maximum shear stress. And last but not least, our angle from our first principal stress to the orientation of our physical stress element is all the way here. This is, you know, 280 is our shear stress right here that, that we got. It's 90 degrees. 
and phi equals 90 degrees equals 2 theta. So theta equals 45 degrees. So that means, again, that if we were to take our stress element at that point and rotate it to an angle of 45 degrees, so instead of looking at it from a horizontal perspective like this, we look at it from on that plane, the stress on that plane is going to be 280 psi in normal stress and there would be zero shear stress on an element in that plane. Finally, we need to specify an appropriate material that will work for this. Now, from before, we found that our combined stresses from the normal and the shear ended up about 600 psi. Now, we also want to have a factor of 10 as a design factor. So multiply that times 10, and you're talking 6,020 psi. But really what we're talking about is, at a minimum, 6,000 psi. We probably don't want to go there. Probably uh, definitely over 6,000 psi. Now, that doesn't mean that we try to find the absolute closest one to that. We want to find the right one. So this is only one of the factors uh, that we would be looking for. So uh, if this is a gear, you know the gear is going to be dealing with wear and fatigue and uh, possibly they might want to have it lubricated so it's got to be uh, able to deal with the lubrication. For all you know, it could be in, in water and you don't want the plastic to be able to take on too much water because plastics have a tendency to uh, retain water. So. There are a lot of other factors, but for starters, we want something that's at least 6,000 PSI, preferably more. So we go to our plastic supplier website. This one happens to be Kerbel Plastics. They have a variety of different plastics available to us, and they have their properties listed right here. Notice how ABS, which is a very common plastic, uh, very versatile, but it is not strong enough. So we're going to have to find something a little different. So I'm going to sort this by tensile strength. And notice how there are a lot of different varieties, but we don't want anything that's this weak. This ETFE is just barely what we need. Same with this Kydex, but notice how this comes in thermoplastic sheet. That's not what we're looking for. We're looking for something that can be uh, injection molded or something like that, maybe even machined. So um, there are a lot of different requirements that I'm not showing you. We just did the uh, analysis for the strength. But if we go up here to uh, polycarbonate, polycarbonate's a, a great material in many ways, very strong. But uh, polycarbonate has, has a tendency to be kind of brittle. And in a fatigue situation like this, it might not be very good. So I'm going to bump up here to the acetyl. I'm going to choose this because, well, I already kind of looked ahead. But it seems to be fairly economical. Uh, but not just that, it's actually kind of designed for it. So let's go over the sheet that they have on acetal. As you read on, it's actually a Delrin material. And that is from DuPont. Notice over here, acetal is widely used for these types of things, including, haha, gears. So I bopped over to the DuPont website, and here is their gear brochure. And there is our picture from the very beginning. So I'm going to move down to this page here, the mechanical properties. So they've got the SI units of 70 and the English or US units of KSI or KPSI. And that's these units here, 10.2, 10.4. So we determined that we needed a material that can take at least 6,000 KSI and we did a little research and we found a material that can take 10 KSI that's 
also designed specifically for use in gearing systems. So this sounds like a very good choice for our application. One other thing I wanted to clarify is that we also used for combined stresses Moore's circle. In review, we were given the task of finding the stresses on a plastic gear shaft and we decided on a strategy of analyzing bending and torsion and then combining them. So we were given the diagram, the loading, uh, some reasonable assumptions, and decided that we needed to find the uh, principal stresses, the sh maximum shear stress, and that's for both types of loading, bending and torsion. Uh, finding their locations, finding the angles, and then finally specify an appropriate material. In order to do that, we needed to pull out these tools. Shear force, bending moment diagrams, bending stress, shear stress and bending, shear stress and torsion, and then analyze our shape properties. Use moment equations and check them as well. We finally plugged those things in and we were able to find our stresses in bending and in torsion, combine them using more circle, and we had to do that in two different ways. Now, uh, our shear stress here for 200 of 280 was uh, comparable to the other ones. It seems that the principal stress of 600 PSI was going to be probably the gating factor. And using that, we multiplied it by 10 because that's what we assume that we'll need as a design factor, found our 6,000 PSI minimum for our material, went to our manufacturer and supplier data sheets, determined that a material that was designed for gears that would withstand the stress was available, and decided that that would be the right material. So I'm going to write that down here. Now, as it stands, Simply acetyl or delrin uh, there are a lot of even types of that particular material. The actual choice of that delrin type is going to depend on many other factors, but it looks like according to this, um, many of those styles of delrin are going to work, so you might choose it for. Uh, its economy, you know, the, the cheaper one, or maybe you need longer lasting, it has to withstand certain chemicals and so on, then you would choose the very specific type of Delrin based on some of the other factors that you're dealing with. Well, I hope that this video helped you understand how to uh, apply combined stresses in a kind of a real world situation and why it's important because if you had just used the 488 PSI maybe you would have chosen one of the uh, weaker materials that are out there uh, that could only withstand 5000 PSI but looks like we needed something somewhat stronger than that. I hope that you continue your studies and uh, keep watching and give me feedback if you find anything good or anything that's lacking. Thank you.